Assalamualaikum and welcome to the Harborn Islamic Study Circle Hisk Sira session 127. So, inshallah, we finished with uh, the Battle of the Ditch, the Battle of the uh, Confederacy or the Allied Forces, uh, Khandak uh, or Ahzab uh, last time. Uh, and so, uh, for this week and uh, inshallah, maybe uh, a bit of next week, uh, we'll be talking about Banu Qurayla. And Banu Qurayla, some uh, scholars, uh, they link this with uh, the Battle of the Ditch because it's essentially follows on the day after uh, or, or the morning after the, uh, the conclusion of the Battle of the Ditch. Uh, and others, obviously, they, they, they put it as a separate battle. Uh, and again, it's Al-Ghazwa, one where the Prophet personally participated uh, in uh, the battle. <coughs> It also has a very uh, strong uh, legal significance from a fiqh perspective. And, and again, I, I mean, I, I um, came across the hadith long before starting studying uh, the Sita because it's a really well-known hadith, uh, the hadith of Banu uh, where and it uh, basically talks, it's, it uh, refers to uh, ikhtilaf or difference of opinion, a valid difference of opinion. Uh, in a Sharia or legalistic framework, and it all relates to this particular story where the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not pray Asr until you get to Banu Quraidah. And uh, there basically there were two interpretations of what the Prophet ﷺ meant by that. Obviously, only one is correct. But the two interpretations of the Sahabi is do they take it literally or figuratively? And so the literal interpretation will be they are not allowed to pray Asr until they get to the precincts of Banu Quraidah. Uh, and then the, the figurative or the metaphorical uh, interpretation is the Prophet simply wanted people to get there quickly. So he's basically saying, hurry up, don't pray until you get there. So you really need to make, um, you know, make an effort to, to, to get there quickly. And again, both people's interpretations are valid uh, because they're, they're they're based upon um, whether they uh, is it, the letter of the law or the meaning of the, the law, um, and scholars have debated about that uh, for a, a long time. But inshallah, not going to dwell on that. But but as I say, perhaps next week we might just talk about those issues because it is as I say such a pivotal <coughs> aspect of our the this issue of difference of valid difference of opinion and again there's a, there's other things we talk about which are not really valid people just made things up or people follow things for their base desires not their uh, uh, understanding of the text uh, to the utmost knowing that this is the closest thing that Allah wants from us and again we'll talk about this uh, later on when we talk about Saad's, uh, Saad ibn Muad's judgment on uh, Banu uh, Quraida. So they're all linked together. So the whole incident is, as I say, it's it's mentioned in virtually all the books of Hadith. It is very, um, very well known. So getting back uh, to the, the story of Banu Quraida, I'm not going to recap on uh, the uh, Battle of the Ditch or Azab. did that last time. Uh, so I'll refer you back last week session when we talk about talk about the lessons and I gave a brief brief recap about the uh, the, the battle so this is the, the the morning after the night before <clears throat> so thunderstorms or windstorms cold you know biting probably freezing wind Abu Sufyan he gives up he, he, he can't rely on Ghatafan and he definitely can't rely on Banu Qurayda who was supposed to launch the counter-offensive from within Medina. So this, this three-pronged attack against the Muslims was their, uh, the, the cause of their haughtiness, the cause of the Quraysh and the, and, 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 and the uh, uh, Ghatafani and, and the Banu Nadirat. They were really confident of their victory uh, be, because uh, they knew that they could, you know, apply their uh, pressure like this. But then uh, Abu Sufyan, he packed up and he left and everyone else left. Uh, and so that was in, in the dead of night, whilst all the wind and the 
the storms are, are, are raging around. And we talk about how Hudayfa uh, came back. So then it's morning time, it's Fajr, they pray, <coughs> and then they, you know, the Muslims survey the scene. And again, it's, it's you know, just a terrible mess there. Everybody has gone. Uh, you know, pots and pans and, and remnants of tents strewn everywhere on the uh, the enemy side. So the Prophet Sallam, he obviously, uh, it, it's not written, but we can assume that he uh, sends out scouts to verify the fact that these guys have actually gone and left and that they're not coming back. This is not a ruse or a guise when they see that things have calmed down, that they're going to regroup and come back. Uh, so obviously, you know, it's as I say, we can we can infer that Prophet Sallam, this is the type of thing that he would do. He he would send out you know uh, uh, reconnaissance missions to make sure that these guys have actually gone gone for good. Uh, and so sending them in the direction of the Quraysh, sending them in the direction of uh, uh, Khatafan. Uh, and then again, you know, with uh, you know with the, the rest of the army, they need to pack up dismantle their tents and their equipment uh, they need to clean up uh, their side of the trench and then obviously go on to the enemy side of the trench uh, and see what there is there clean that up and and just sort those things out uh, because now is the time to do it and then come uh, and then come back you're not going to keep coming back and, and forth uh, as an army so uh, so no doubt the first few hours after Fajr were uh, done uh, in that uh, sense, in terms of cleaning up, gathering uh, uh, intel, and just securing uh, the perimeter. They're obviously, not going to, you know, uh, fill in the trench just yet, because they're all been tied. I mean, it's been nearly a month, you know, uh, twenty to thirty days, or you know, uh, twenty-five days of of being laid siege to in the bitter cold and this is the middle of winter as well and again that's significant because the uh, the, the, the 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 time is much shorter in terms of you know between you know Zohor uh, and uh, Asar and Maghrib because it is it is uh, winter time so anyway <clears throat> so they, uh, they 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 pack up they, uh, they they clean and you know the the army gets you know uh, dispatched back and they go slowly back to their homes and the brothers of again we can infer that he's going to be one of the the last people to leave the battlefield once he's you know uh, assured everything is sorted out then he makes his way back. By the time the Prophet uh, comes back uh, home, uh, and it's uh, stated that he went to Umm uh, Salama's uh, home, um, and it was her turn on the rotation. Uh, so he essentially, and there's a slight difference of opinion, but essentially he's just taking off his armor. So, you know, he's unbuckled his sword, putting it down, he's about to take his armor off, and uh, under the narration, say that he's taken his armor off and he's basically stepping into the bath i mean this is the first time literally in a month that they can somewhat relax the the existential threat of being wiped out is gone others come to their aid and dispersed the enemy so you know uh he's about to uh have a bath uh, and then a jibril walks in and jibril says to him, you know, uh, Ya Rasulullah, why have you put your weapons down? You know, and, and it, it said, uh, and, you know, that uh, he was wearing a, a Jibril Islam was wearing a turban or soft brocade, riding a, uh, a mule or, a, uh, you know, uh, a mule-like creature with a saddle of silk. So, you know, quite uh, luxurious and obviously it stands out because this is you know uh, one of the head of the angels so Jibreel uh, asked the brothers what well, you know how come you put your weapon down uh, and uh, Jibreel then says look as for the angels we have not put our weapons down yet and I've just arrived with an extra battalion uh, yeah Muhammad Allah is commanding you to go over there and he points to Bonokoreda to go to Bonokoreda. 
So the processor immediately understood what needed to be done. Again, this is a commandment uh, from above the seven heavens. He has to follow it, put aside the, 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 the whole month of fatigue, of tiredness, of ex physical and mental exhaustion. He literally just got into the house and he was saying, look, no time to rest. You've got to finish the job. And he goes, I'm heading over there right now and I will shake the earth from them. So he's gonna, so Jubil Islam, his, his, his role and his function is he's basically going to cast terror into the hearts of Banu Qurayda. So the Prophet um, he's not in a fit state to go immediately himself and the instruction is clear, he has to go and start this uh, counter campaign against uh, and again, these are the, the last remaining uh, all Jewish tribe within the precincts of uh, Medina. So when the Prophet um, entered Medina, there's Banu Qaynuka, Banu Nadir, and Banu Qurayda. Uh, the the Banu Qaynuka, uh, uh, they had uh, uh, done some uh, evil things, especially to the, the, the lady in the market, and then uh, they were uh, exiled, but not before Abdul ibn Ubay. He sort of held on to the Prophet Sallam's armor and said, "Give them to me, give them to me." And the Prophet Sallam, you know, uh, said, "Fine, you decide on their fate." And then uh, they were uh, told to go. Banu Nadir, they were the ones uh, who, where the Prophet Sallam went uh, to uh, get a portion of the blood money. They plotted actively to assassinate him by throwing a big rock or a millstone on his head as he's waiting outside the fortress the process of he stand he stood up and you know he walked when the Sahabi followed and then he laid siege and and, and again they were were banished but allowed to take their possessions. So this is Banu Kainuka, the only remaining uh, 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 Jewish tribe. So the Prophet he, uh, I mean, he can't himself go just now. So uh, he uh, sends out a town crier and alert people to basically say to them, you know, whoever hears this has to obey it. No one can pray uh, ex uh, except when they get to Banu Qurayda. I'm saying no one can pray. They've already prayed the Dhuhr, and this is the period of time between Dhuhr and Asr. So no one's allowed to pray until they get to Banu Qurayda. Now, Banu Qurayda, it's within the precincts of, you know, greater Medina, you could say. Uh, and uh, and so uh, people, you know, who've, who've come back from the front line, they're in different states of readiness. Uh, some may have come back already, taken their armor off, had their bath, had their siesta, because it's the whole time, and, and sort of r r relaxing and chilling. Others will have been, you know, uh, doing other, you know, uh, chores as well. Um, so, so people in a different state of, of readiness. Uh, and uh, but the, the announcement goes: you cannot pray until you get to Banu Qurayda. And then that aside, the Prophet, you know, summons Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, and says, you know, uh, orders him to be the first one to go. And again. Ali's in the same situation, you know, but he says, look, you have to go immediately and, you know, uh, plag, uh, uh, plant the flag of Islam outside Banu Qurayda, the, the Raya. It needs, you know, so they know they uh, mean business. There's no letter for them. They may have thought they, they sort of got a bit of a reprieve because the enemies have gone, but no, you've got to demonstrate that this is serious. So Ali bin Talib, obviously, he goes and he, you know, plants the uh, the raya the, the 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 flag of war uh, in front of Banu Qurayda, where it, all of them can see, uh, and then you know uh, the, uh, the the people inside the fortress there are shouting and screaming, and they're hurling insults at Ali bin Vitali because they know what this means that basically they are under attack. The Prophet has declared war on them. Uh, and so they're they're uh, they're, they're uh, saying all these things. So uh, uh, Ali uh, sets up, you know, uh, camp with 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 a group of uh, his uh, uh, you know uh, soldiers uh, there. So um, this is this is business. 
And so the process of him, he gets his things and he gets ready and he puts on his uh, armor again uh, and then he makes his way to uh, Banu Qurayda and then on the way there he sees some other people who are going there again they're, they're not on high alert but they have to go you know with a sense of urgency and he asks them you know have you uh, have you seen anyone go by what's what's the situation you know what are people up to and these people say look we haven't seen anyone apart from uh, Dihya uh, Al Qalbi and he's riding on a white mule uh, and that's the only person we've seen and so the Prophet says uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, Dihya, uh, Dihya he's no uh, uh, random person so whenever Jibril would would come and uh, in his uh, shape-shifting uh, manner if he wanted to be uh, seen in a physical form he would uh, so other people can see him sometimes he would come invisible to everyone but the Prophet some would see him uh, sometimes he'd come in a, a physical form so that everyone can see him and so when he's in that state where he wants people to see that he's around he would take the form of the most beautiful person around and it was agreed that the most handsome man in Medina at the time was Dihya so he would impersonate you know, he'd transfigure his form to look like uh, Dihya. Uh, and so people would say, oh, we've just seen Dihya on a, on, a, on a white mule. And so they wouldn't think anything of it, other than the fact, well, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, Dihya. Um, so they said, well, you know, we've, we've just seen him. And the Prophet said, no, that was Jibril. Uh, and uh, and uh, to, to rush down to the ground to, to cause... Um, a, uh, to cause the ground beneath uh, the Abu uh, to to shake, to cause a mini earthquake, yeah, essentially. So the process of he then reached Abu uh, and then uh, Ali bin Fatal rushed towards him and says, "Ya Rasulullah, don't camp here where I've camped. Camp over here." And the Prophet knew knew why and said, "Why? Why is that? Um, are they saying things about me?" And um, perhaps you don't want me to hear those things. And I said, yeah, they are. They're sort of saying some nasty things. So the Prophet said, uh, once they see me, they, they won't have the gall to say those things from inside their fortresses. Um, so the Prophet he sets up camp, you know, uh, close to them where they can see him. And uh, he shouts out to them, oh, Jews, aren't you humiliated enough? And then they say, look, you know, uh, you would never want to act foolishly. Essentially, basically saying, look, go easy on us. Um, but the Prophet, he, uh, he, he didn't take that and he told them to surrender. You have to surrender unconditionally. Uh, there's n n nothing to negotiate. Uh, but they, they refused. So the Prophet ordered the siege to commence. So he gave them the opportunity to surrender. They didn't. So then he laid siege. So then the siege starts and, and basically again just essentially uh, for as long as the siege of uh, the uh, Khandaq lasted it said that Banu Qurayda lasted at least as long as that so another so they've already been late siege in nearly a month this lasts for about 25 days right so Khandaq between 25 and 30 days you know a month this is you adding on an extra 25 days immediately after this is the morning after the the end of uh, uh, Hunda. Uh, so uh, so things are dragging on they're being laid siege their supplies inside their fortress are dwindling and they know the Muslims aren't getting any if anything the Muslims are getting stronger and it said that in the early days of the siege the, uh, the, the the Muslims would be there in the daytime and then there'd only be a few people at night uh, and then they'd come back in, 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 in the daytime. But as the days went on, more and more Muslims were laying siege completely to the fortress and they would stay there. They were properly encamped. So they could see that the actual siege was becoming fortified and there's no way in or out. So uh, so then uh, uh, inside you've got the leader of Banu uh, Nadir, uh, Khuyay bin Akhtab, and we'll come on to him in a second, but you've got the, the chief of uh, the uh, Banu Quraida. Again, he's a reasonable man, but we talked about how sort of weak-willed he was. In, in, you know, he, he didn't want to break the truce, but Khuyay 
you know, essentially convinced him, forced him, you could say, to break the truce with the Prophet but it was still his choice. He could have said no, but he went along with it. So, uh, you know, this is, you know, so again, get, getting towards the end of the 25 days, so 23, 24 days in, you've got uh, Qab uh, bin Asad basically saying, right, turns to the people, they gather all the elders uh, and the chiefs and says, look, we've got, there's, n there's no way of getting around this. We've, we've got to do something. Uh, so um, the options are that basically we accept this man's religion for by Allah, wallahi, we know that he is the prophet that has been predicted in our books. And if we become Muslim, you know, if we accept his religion, we know that our lives and our property will be safe, right? So that's the first option. And that's the most agreeable option, the most sensible option, you know, become a Muslim. We know he's been, uh, he's the chap we're waiting for. The rabbis have talked about it. It's written in our books and all the signs, all the miracles is clear and it's evident that he is the, 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 the chosen one, the prophet that we've been waiting for. Let's follow him. And then that's the end of it. We get to live. Uh, and uh, and uh, then the, uh, the, the people in consensus basically said, you know, wallahi, we will never leave our religion. Right? the religion of Moses right um, and, and, and and the fascinating thing is is, is these guys I mean it, it always amazes me how people could could actually be like that they know this is the truth and they willfully disobey the truth and they willfully stick to a position that they know is lesser inferior or wrong Right? They've, there is no doubt that this was the Prophet. The miracles are clear, the signs are clear, but they refuse. And this is again going back to this, this, this possibly this issue of tribalism, nationalism, racism that we are the Jewish people, we are the Banu Quraida. How could, um, how could an Arab be our savior? And again, we see this nowadays in, in, in the people we mix with. You turn around and they're proud to be Pakistani above everything else. They're proud to be Egyptian or they're proud uh, to be, you know, Sudanese, right? And these, this is the main thing that they are loyal to, right? Um, and, you know, uh, and other people, when they know what is the truth, they, for their own desires, follow things which deep down inside they know aren't true right and again this could be you know in either issues it could be in thick issues where they are following their base desires because it's easy for them right and deep down they know they're looking for loopholes um you know and we'll talk about that you know when we talk about the corridor as well so option one become a muslim and they all reject it okay then Kaab as the chief says okay fine you've rejected that you're not going to go back to that okay uh, you've had your meaningful vote and you've said no to option one which is become Muslim okay option two then let us kill our own families our women and children and then we charge them with our swords drawn until every last one of us dies and if we die then so be it we died we're our own considered martyrs but if we win then we know know that there'll be plenty of women to marry later and we can start our families again. So basically saying, look, you know, if you are gonna fight them, you're gonna do it half-heartedly. But if you if you sever your ties with the dunya, your women, your children, and all of these things, you will fight to the death. You it will be do or die. And we see this in some of the other battles as well, that you know, uh, there you've got nothing to lose. Right? So therefore, that is the proper fight. Okay, Let's kill them, and, and then we know that they're not going to be uh, taken captives. Right, And then we, we it's do or die mission. If we win, fantastic. We marry again. We'll keep the, the tribe going. Right, And, and we'll, we'll not have lost our, uh, our religion, etc. 
Um, but and if we die, well, at least we died for our cause. We'll be considered martyrs. So the, the, the elders and the people say, look, look, we're never going to kill our own family. I mean, you're talking rubbish here. How, how can you say that? So then Qab was forced to say, okay, fine. You had another meaningful vote on option two, and you've rejected that. So therefore, if you refuse the first two, the only other way around, you, I know you're not going to surrender, the only thing to do is we launch a surprise attack. And let's surprise attack them tomorrow, which is on Saturday, the Sabbath. And they will not be expecting us to break our own Sabbath. These are people we've grown up with. They know we don't fight on the Sabbath. So if we launch, there will be no better time to launch an offensive than to catch them off guard. And the only way we can catch them off guard is to fight on the Sabbath. Uh, and uh, then that's our highest probability of, 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 of winning. Uh, and uh, they're not gonna, they're, they're, they won't expect us to do that. Uh, and uh, and then uh, and then a furore amongst the people. So look, we're never going to break the Sabbath. Don't you know that if we break the Sabbath, Allah is going to send a severe punishment on us. So they've, you know, by a meaningful vote, they've rejected options one, two, and three. So then Qab got angry. So look, you're not going to surrender. You're not going to become Muslim. You're not going to uh, kill your women and children, do or die, uh, and, and you're not going to you know, willing to do a, a surprise attack because. You know, at the beginning of the the month, things you know, you know, they weren't as strong as before. Now we now the army is not budging. There's no let up in 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 the people laying siege. It's just going to get harder and harder as time moves on, and our supplies are going to dwindle. And so he gets angry and says, "Look, Wallahi, since the day your mothers gave birth to you, you've not, never been able to make a decision in your lives." Again, if this is the you know, uh, some would say a, 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 a trait of prevarication uh, and, and, and wordsmiths that some of these people have. So those options aren't, aren't there for them. So then they try to negotiate. They know that Prophet has demanded unconditional surrender. So they, they send a delegation to the Prophet uh, and they say, Oh, uh, uh, Bokasim. Uh, uh, you know, give us what you gave to Banu Nadir. Again, so this is the negotiation. Okay, um, let us. You can take our lands and our, 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 our orchards and our properties, but let us take our money, our camels, and our family, and we'll go. Okay, so they're, they're, they're obviously negotiating, the bargaining, start high, and work their way down. You know, you did it for Banu Nadir. Do it again for us. I take all our uh, our property and uh, but let us go with our uh, our wealth and our family. The Prophet says no, so the delegation comes back and, and says, okay, fine. Keep everything, keep our property, keep our money and our wealth uh, and everything that we have. Just let us go, as in the men and the women and the children. Just let us go. And the Prophet says no. That's that's that, that, that that's a no go. I will not accept anything except an unconditional surrender. Okay. And again, the Prophet is 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 being clear. I mean, he could have, you know, if 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 he was unscrupulous, he could have accepted this and then, as they come out, then pounce on them and kill them and slaughter them. But no, as a Muslim, we we can't be treacherous. We can't make these promises and break them like that. So, uh, you know, straight up, no, sorry, unconditional uh, surrender. So then Banu Qurayza, they're flailing, well, what, what can we do? So they ask, okay, can, uh, we want to, to talk to Abu Lubaba, you know, uh, can you uh, send Abu Lubaba and we'll, we'll take Mashra uh, from him. The person said, okay, fine, take your time. And summoned Abu Lubaba and said, "Go, uh, go see what they uh, want." Uh, and so uh, Abu Lubaba he went in a personal capacity, invitation of uh, Banu Qurayza, uh, and they wanted him because he was their closest uh, from uh, their closest ally uh, in uh, for to uh, from the house 
of uh, Banu uh, Quraida, and they were special friends, you know, in the times of of, of Jahiliya. And he's a great Sahabi. He's fought in Uhud, uh, and he was there at Badr and given a special mission, um, and uh, and so you know he's he's quite highly ranked. So senior person, so Bula Baba, you know, he accepts the invitation. And, and he goes, but he's not negotiating on behalf of the Prophet Sallam. He's going there as as, uh, as an invited guest, and and basically they're just sounding out Abu Lubaba. Uh, he, he walks into the fortress, and the, the, the women, the children, the elders, they're happy to see him. They gather round him. The uh, the women and the children, they're, they're they're begging, they're crying for mercy, as if it's up to him. Uh, and 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 then when the commotion dies down, they they say to Abu Lubaba because. You know, you know, they, they trust him and he knows that he's their good friend. Should we surrender or not? So, wise counsel. So, uh, Abu Lubaba, he knows the Prophet has basically said that he wants an unconditional surrender, right? Uh, so, that, that's as much, and, and the Prophet has not at this point in time stipulated what the outcome of the siege is going to be. Are they going to be released? Are they going to be slaughtered? Are they going to be captive or whatever? He's, he's not, you know, said anything from his lips. He's just laid siege and said unconditional surrender. So, uh, you know, uh, but it's understood. E even, even the elders of Banu Quraitha, they knew what the likely outcome is. But they're asking, they're, they're, they're clutching at straws here. So they said, look, should we surrender or not? And he goes, yeah, of course you should surrender. But know this, and he made... Uh, an indication that basically they're gonna die. The Prophet he's gonna kill you, right? He didn't say it. He just he just motioned with his hands, surrender, but know this, okay? And then as soon as he said that, you know, uh, he'd recount this in the first person. As soon as he said that, he said, "Wallahi, my feet had not moved except I realized I had been disloyal and treacherous to Allah and His Messenger." He had no authority to say that. Right, um, and you know, uh, although that was what was likely to happen, he's not in you know in 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 a position to you know give anything away from the side of the Muslims, um, and so he, you know, and 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 this is basically because because he's surrounded by all these, you know, his friends from the days of Jahiliya, you know, and, and all the begging and mercy. You know he's you know they, they've managed to soften him up a little bit uh, and and just you know almost instinctively he just said yes yeah, surrender but right so he realizes he's made a mistake so then basically he excuses himself and basically scarpers out of there uh, and he, he he doesn't go back to the muslim camp he avoids the muslim camp and he goes straight to the, uh, the, the masjid of the Prophet and ties himself up to a pillar in uh, in the process of uh, uh, masjid masjid al uh, or gets his wife to tie him up, and he and he makes a vow or oath: I will uh, not I will remain uh, tied to this pillar until Allah accepts my repentance, and I will never go near Banu Qurayda again, for I will never be in an area where I disobeyed Allah and His Messenger. And just think, you know. Here we are, all of us, disobeying uh, Allah and His Messenger uh, all the time on many things, minor things and major things, but we don't have that level of, uh, of repentance about our actions, and we're we're haughty, we're proud of what what we, sometimes people are proud of not obeying Allah and His Messenger, you know, and, and they show off those things. Here, you know, there was a there was a semblance of disobedience. And that said, you know, this is how much his iman wrapped him with guilt instantaneously. And he went and uh, he tied himself up there. The Prophet he's back in the Muslim camp, the headquarters, the, 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 the GHQ. And then there's no no word from Abu al-Baba. So he's asking me, well, what happened with Abu al-Baba? We sent him. The delegation came. They asked him. We sent him. No news about him. And then the news came. Well, actually, this is what happened. He's tied himself up for whatever reason to the, the, the pillar in the mosque and he's asking for repentance. Prophet then gave a sign, but he just said, Look, if only he'd come to me, I would have asked Allah to forgive him. But uh, now that he's done this, I cannot help him. 
right? He's all, he's, you know, uh, if he'd come to me, I would have asked Allah, but he's made a direct oath to Allah. It's out of my hands now. And it said, you know, that basically stayed there for six or seven days for a week, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, at, at every prayer time, his wife would come and, and um, untie him. He'd pray, he'd pray uh, and eat maybe, uh, and then he'd be tied back up. And so, you know, he's there uh, uh, in the Prophet's mosque and everyone can see him near the front of the mosque the, that, that pillar is still there known as the, the pillar of Toba or the pillar of uh, 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 Abu Lubaba uh, and it's, it's got a sign on it and again it's in the, it's in the old section of the, 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 the masjid uh, so there's the, the, the pillar of, of Toba and other people then that became a sunnah they, they would tie themselves to the same uh, pillar or they'd be near, near there asking for, for forgiveness um, so he stayed there and, he's, uh, and then, uh, you know, when uh, the so the rule happened, we'll come on to that in a second, and then sort of uh, six, seven days later, the Prophet son is about to, uh, 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 he, he woke up for Fajr and he starts to laugh. And then uh, again, he's with Umm Salama that, uh, that, on that occasion. And she asks him, you know, uh, why are you laughing? May Allah, you know, keep you laughing and happy all the time. Uh, and uh, the Prophet says, uh, Allah has accepted the tawbah, the repentance of Abu Lubaba. So Umm Salama said, well, shall, I, shall I go and tell him then? She goes, yeah, of course, go and tell him. So she goes and, and, and tells the people and they tell him, uh, and uh, oh, Abu Lubaba, uh, thank Allah for he has forgiven you. Again, it's so beautiful. Thank Allah for because he's forgiven you. He goes, no, until the Prophet comes and unties me with his own hands, I'm not going to move. So the Prophet gets ready. Uh, for for Fajr and he goes there, sees him still there, knows that he's he said look, I, he wants the Prophet to untie him. He unties him, uh, and uh, and there's said to be a couple of verses that relate to this uh, uh, incident in the Quran, and one of them is from Surah Al Tawbah, one of the latter verses, uh, surahs rather, and uh, where Allah says, and there are those who have acknowledged their sins, their errors or transgressions, and they have mixed the righteous deed. With another that was bad, you know. So there are a lot of good deeds, but they've done some bad things as well. Perhaps Allah will turn to them in forgiveness, for indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. And some of the scholars have said this verse, Surah Al-Tawbah, verse 102, is is one of the most um, pleasant or optimistic of all the verses because, you know, whenever Allah says He might or perhaps forgive. He will always uh, forgive. So again, this shows that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he will forgive if you are sincere and repent uh, in, in what you do. So uh, 24 uh, days have gone. They've been having these discussions. They've talked to Abu Lubaba, and, and they know there's no way out. They have to unconditionally surrender. And some of them might still think that the Prophet Salam might grant them their uh, their wish because you know if and with an unconditional surrender that he you know he might do that he is the merciful and we've seen what's happened to one of so they're 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 holding on to that faint hope and expectation of uh, forgiveness so they they basically say, Look, tomorrow we have to surrender so you know uh, complete all your affairs tonight because this will be the last uh, night here um so, and it's noted that that night, the 24th night, in the middle of the night, um, there's one chap, uh, Amr bin Saad, uh, a, a Jewish uh, lad, um, who uh, basically, I mean, they all knew what was likely to happen, but he took that opportunity uh, to leave uh, Banu uh, Quraida. So he packs his things and, and uh, no, he leaves. And he was one of the few handful of people who vocalized their objection to what the elders were doing right so they had uh, officially uh, launched uh, not launched they had officially uh, uh, declared that they were against what these people had done and this is a really important thick point so the, 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 the elders in the community had decided on a course of action and these people had 
uh, 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 vocally said, I disagree with this. Obviously, we need to go along with it, but I disagree with this uh, action and this course of action that you've taken, right? Um, and, uh, and again, this is really important uh, for us. Um, if you stay silent where there is injustice, then you have essentially acquiesced to that. And we saw that with the other tribes, right? Especially with, uh, you know, Banu Nadir, when they're arguing, should we assassinate the Prophet right? Then collective, they come to this collective agreement, yes, let's, let's assassinate him. And there weren't any uh, prominent vocal objections to that. Right? People had exercised their will and stayed silent. So therefore they, they have acquiesced as a community, you know, all for one, one for all. Here, this chap, Amr ibn, uh, Amr ibn Saad, he had at the time contemporaneously said, this is wrong. We've made a pact, we should stick to it. We can't turn our backs on it. So, uh, so he, you know, he'd made clear he's not part of this injustice and so you can't tar him with that brush so he knows they're going to uh, surrender the next day so he tries his luck he packs his things and he goes in the middle of the night and he, he you know um, he comes out and he uh, says uh, he meets Muhammad ibn uh, Maslama again a really uh, strong uh, Sahabi um, and uh, who, who hears him and, and says who are you and he goes, I'm uh, Amr uh, bin Saad, you know, and, and whether or not Muhammad bin Ibn Masman knew of his objections, we, we don't know. Uh, but uh, he knew that this was uh, Amr bin Saad uh, and that, you know, he was a man of principle and uh, he was from Banu uh, uh, Quraida. So Muhammad uh, Ibn Masman, he's in this really tricky situation. What does he do? He's got Amr bin Saad wanting safe passage. So then he makes a dua to Allah or a request to Allah and says, Oh Allah, overlook my overlooking of him. He can't look into his heart, but one man at peace, he's not there to fight. He just basically says, Look, I'm not with these people anymore. I, you know, I wanted to stay true to the covenant. You know, I'm, I'm not going to have any of this. So then it said, Amr uh, ibn Saad, he, he left Banu Quraida, stayed that night in Medina, and then he was gone in the morning. So uh, then obviously Muhammad ibn, uh, ibn Masama, he went to the Prophet and this is what happened. And then the Prophet basically reassured him and said, that was a man that Allah saved him because of his honesty, because of his integrity, right? It's not that, you know, uh, he became a Muslim. And again, you know, it's not that the, the Muslims were against these people because of their religion. No, it's because of what they'd done. This man had visibly objected to the treachery so I want no part of this. And then as part of that, you know, when it, uh, it was, you know, possibly safe for him, he said, I, I'm out. Uh, and, and, and he left. And we don't know what happened to him after that. It's not recorded in the books if he became Muslim or not. Where he went to, he just melted into the night, essentially. Uh, uh, but the important thing is that the Prophet wasn't angry with Muhammad ibn Maslama. So look, Allah guided him because of his honesty. You know, uh, he stayed true to the treaty and he was saved because of that. So then it's the morning, they've, uh, they've agreed to unconditionally surrender. So uh, the message came, we're willing to surrender on your terms, on the Prophet's terms. So when, as soon as that news came, uh, the, the Aus, the tribe, uh, who are of closest allegiance to Banu Quraida, uh, and we talked before about how Banu uh, Qainuka, they were uh, allied to the Khazraj. Uh, and again, you know, that, that's why Abdullah ibn Ubay, he was so insistent, you know, on, on you know, the process of handing them over to him. Uh, was it or was it Banu uh, Nadir? But anyway, uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, who, who most people had acknowledged, was, uh, was a hypocrite but openly confessed Islam, obviously, in, you know, uh, but his actions were, were, were of treachery. And we'll come across a few more of those uh, uh, later on. Um, so, uh, so that the, the Aus, so this is Sa'ad uh, ibn Mu'ad uh, and Sa'ad ibn Abada, uh, so uh, Sa'ad, uh, it's their tribe. 
uh, so they uh, they immediately flock to the Prophet Sallam and they surround him um, and uh, they basically say look uh, and it's nothing to do with the Muhajireen it's nothing to do with the Khazraj they're staying out of this they're, you know they're, so the Aus they're, 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 the previous loyalties they, they, they kick in and they come and they surround Prophet Sallam and say Ya Rasulullah you know you spared the Khazraj's tribe Banu Nadir so spare our tribe as well uh, you know so he did it for Abdul ibn Abay so you know you spare them spare us be consistent they're trying to say trying to sort of uh, use this opportunity to to influence his decision uh, because he hasn't vocalized what the outcome of it you know he just wants that unconditional surrender he says he hasn't said what's going to happen uh, but they keep badgering him and say, look, you did it for them, do it for those, be consistent, you know. Um, so the Prophet um, he then uses that sort of ploy uh, and, and sort of stroke of genius again. He says, look, will you be happy if one of your own decides their fate? Of course, they said, right? So essentially he's using the, the, the same example, the precedent that has already been sent. He let Abdullah ibn Bay decide their fate, some, uh, you know, Banu uh, Nadir's fate. Um, so it says, fine, I'll be uh, consistent. I'll let one of you, your own leaders, chiefs, decide the fate. You're going to be happy with that. And they said, of course. And so I have chosen for you Saad ibn Mu'adh, your own leader. And again, this is a fan, fan, you know, fantastic stroke of genius, right? So, so the Prophet um, he is uh, abdicating his uh, 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 ability to cast judgment and delegating it, or abdicating and delegating it to uh, Saad ibn Mu'adh, who's known, he's a youngster, who's known to be have a strong you know, uh, but also, you know, uh, merciful uh, uh, and, and, and a just uh, leader. So, so you, you guys decide uh, 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 that uh, Saad ibn Mu'ad will be the judge, and that is the judgment that Allah and His Messenger will comply with. So, uh, this is uh, uh, Saad's uh, judgment. So at that point in time, Saad ibn Mu'adh, he has been nursed in the hospital uh, tent in the Masjid al-Nabwi. Uh, he sustained the injury, you know, during uh, when, uh, during the, uh, the, the Battle of the Ditch. Uh, and again, it's a near fatal wound, uh, but he's slowly bleeding out, right? And uh, he's being nursed by uh, Rufaida, who is uh, who has volunteered to be the nurse uh, for this and other battles, uh, and, and sort of you know, the, so the, the the mini field hospital that they've set up in in the the, the, the masjid, that's where she she is, and he's been bleeding there. So he's been Sa's been bleeding for at least twenty five days. If we take it from the end of uh, the Battle of the Ditch to now, that's twenty five days, and quite possibly a few uh, days before that as well, when he actually got injured by the Arab. So the decision is his, and they have to get him from the the, the hospital tent in uh, Masjid al-Nabwi to Banu Quraida, uh, 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 so uh, for him to cast uh, judgment. And so, as uh, you know, before they it go there, the the the, the Aus are really happy, and they send an advance party straight over to Saad to basically pressurize him. As much as they were pressurizing the process of it. So we'll pick up the story, inshallah, next week from this point where Saad is being uh, delegated to make the decision. What is his decision? How he comes to it? And what happens subsequent uh, to that? And then the outcome uh, of, of, of what he had decided. But inshallah, we'll talk about that next week. So until then, inshallah, do uh, remember uh, the Ummah and us in your duas, please. Uh, do uh, uh, you know make any comments, uh, queries, questions? Facebook, you know, uh, uh, WhatsApp, YouTube, uh, like, share, etc., etc. Uh, and uh, inshallah, we'll you know carry on uh, second part of Banu Quraida next week. Um, and uh, just again to say thank you to everyone for uh, 
least you do, uh, for for listening, uh, spending your time with me. Um, and again, you know, there's a whole host of things that you could be doing. And alhamdulillah, you know, may Allah uh, bless you for listening uh, to me and, you know, uh, 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 allowing me to uh, get closer to, you know, uh, Allah and his Rasul through this uh, research, uh, through this uh, this series. Uh, and, you know, may Allah, may Allah allow all of us to benefit from this and to increase our love of the Prophet Sallam uh, and to get closer to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these uh, little uh, sessions. So I'll finish there. Uh, so, Bismillah uh, uh, ar-Rahim. Wa inna al-insan wa ti khusr illa ladhin aam wa amna suwa alayhati wa tawasu bil haq wa tawasu bil sabur. Jazakallah khair everybody. Assalamu alaikum.